Crazy Eddie announces the grand opening of a brand new store. That's right, Crazy Eddie's coming to Route 22 Union, New Jersey this Saturday, March 17th. It's going to be the most earth-shattering grand opening ever. Thousands of free gifts, free t-shirts, Humphrey Flyers, yo-yos. You know that Crazy Eddie has the lowest prices on anything and everything in home entertainment equipment. Well, now Crazy Eddie is coming to Route 22 in Union, New Jersey with the lowest prices ever. Crazy Eddie's great new union store on Route 22, grand opening this Saturday, March 17th. Be there! When I was... 14 years old, I, I started working for Crazy Eddie. That's the same Crazy Eddie who committed one of the most outrageous financial statement frauds in history. Eddie Antar, the president, CEO, and major shareholder of the company, uh, was convicted of uh, like 17 counts of fraud. What happened was, it was it, the case was overturned on the technicality. Eventually, he pled guilty and is serving about eight years in prison. And there's a saying that you can do more with a pencil than with a gun. And in some aspects, it's true. And I think in this aspect, it's true. Over $400, $500 million worth of investors' money, and God knows how, much, how many lives have been shattered by this. So there's a lot of bad things that were done. I knew the consequences of what I was doing, and I, I, I knew that I was hurting people. And a lot of people got hurt by it. We were a bait and switch company. That's why it's called Crazy Eddie, the advertisements. It's all in the name. Crazy Eddie's just advertise. Get your best price and then come into Crazy Eddie, we'll beat it. What does that tell you? You got to come and haggle to get the price. We're not honest. We can't give you the right price right away. I mean, uh, Eddie was the tough guy that everybody looked to if there was a problem. If there was a problem, Eddie was there. He was a muscular guy. He was a good looking guy, a very charismatic kind of a guy. Uh, I was very friendly with Eddie and Eddie's brother, Mitchell. And I was very friendly as Eddie. Eddie was like a godlike figure to me, even before I went to Crazy Eddie's. What was born as a family conspiracy to skim money and evade taxes grew to a financial fraud of huge proportions, and it ended with victims everywhere. And what happened was that the money would come, the, the stores would, would tally up their sales. There was no real internal controls. They just add up all of their cash, add up all of their, add up all of their checks, and add up all of their charges. They had a thousand dollars in that a hundred thousand dollars in cash, fifty thousand in checks, and twenty thousand deposit in charges, one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. They bring it to my father's house. My father says, "Okay, uh, how much do you guys want to skim? Okay, we're gonna skim fifty thousand dollars. Fine. Takes fifty fifty thousand out of the hundred thousand dollars, and." takes it to the office the next day. We did 50,000 in cash, we did 50,000 in checks, we did 20,000 in charges, $120,000 gets deposited. It never shows up on the books. It, ju it just doesn't exist. There's only a certain amount of money you can skim and what's the use of it? Um, what, what, what was made in 1979 was a conscious decision. We're skimming about $3 million, maybe $4 million a year. We're skimming most of the profit from, from Crazy Eddie's. It's not good to skim most of the profit from Crazy Eddie's because if there's no profit being showed, how are you going to go public? There's no profit. So what was done, so they said, so, so the thought process was like this. Well, we can't just stop skimming at all because that ain't going to help neither. What was done was um, a plan was made was to skim less money each year, starting around... And that means it's time for Crazy Eddie's Christmas sale! Crazy Eddie's... I think it was around the Christmas of 78. That was $1.5 million of this previously skimmed money was taken out of Israel, wired to Bank Uyumi, Panama, with 10 or 12 or 14 drafts from $20,000 to $120,000 were brought to Crazy Eddie through Panama from the Antars accounts in Israel. They're only counting your inventory at the end of the year, your accounts payable at the end of the year. They're checking your depreciation schedules, they're making sure that there's proper cutoff testing. From the day the auditors leave, which is about 60 days at the end of the year, at the, uh, from 60 days from the end of the fiscal year, which is 60 days into the new fiscal year, you can do almost anything you want and there's really nothing that they're going to ever detect. We found a vendor that was willing to cooperate with us. And what he had done was he would buy merchandise, give us the checks in small amounts, and what we would be able to do is take those checks in small amounts. He would buy, say, half a million dollars worth of merchandise, he'd give us $10,000, $50,000 checks, and we would just add it to the deposits for the various stores, increasing the sales for the various stores for various quarters. We wanted the numbers to go down, but we wanted them to go down as slowly as possible without there being any problems. 
So, and then your idea then would be that in four or five years you've worked yourself out of the fraud and everything's right. cool. Right, but what happened was that that wasn't going to be able to happen because the numbers were going down so fast, taking such a free fall, that basically all of this four or five years was going to be compacted into a three month period. And what happened was is that the company started to become very vulnerable. What I mean by that was the company was legitimately losing money. And we have previously, previous frauds, and we have to cover these previous frauds and also start reporting losses, but we didn't want to report losses in such a way that it would alert that these that previous frauds had been committed. There was two buyers in cahoots with us. There was my cousin Mitchell, who was in charge of the buyers. There was Kathy, she was accounts payable, she was in cahoots also, she was, I was her, uh, I was her boss. And we would generate these phony debit memos in the pricing of the inventories. They should have taken into account these excessive debit memos and reduced the pricing of these inventories accordingly. As it was explained to me, it was, it was fairly simple. Um, there was, you have to picture a warehouse, there's, there's boxes all over the place, tons of boxes uh, uh, of merchandise, uh, all in rows, sometimes neatly stacked and sometimes not neatly stacked. And the merchandise is not always visible to the naked eye. It's stacked in front of merchandise, stacked in front of merchandise, stacked, and it's on top. The inventories were inflated by adding digits and or quantities on the count sheets. They concentrated on high-priced, slow-moving items. Some auditors would go there and take a test counts. But what would happen was that they would not ascertain what the real numbers were behind the boxes. They would rely upon those two Crazy Eddie employees for their counts in areas where they couldn't climb up and see how much merchandise was behind. And they would, they would, they would say, you know, how much uh, 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 televisions do we have of this brand? And uh, there would be really, there would be really 50. But you'd say, no, it's 120. It's 125. And the auditor would take the number, write down 125, and so on and so on and so on. Because one of the uh, staff caught it, reported it to his manager. The manager reported it to the partner. The partner reported it to my cousin, Eddie, and top management. Now, look what happened. This looks like there's something going on here in these three stores. And what did Eddie do? Play dumb? He played dumb. He says, you know, something I don't dispute you. Something must have happened here. But why would we do it? Why, you know, who would be so stupid as to cross a 10 out and make a 20? If you're going to do it, wouldn't it be an easy way of doing it? I mean, who would, you know, it must be somebody just trying to cause trouble for us. And they bought it. There was no, there was no, um, there was no note in the audit work papers. There was no report to the outside director. There was no nothing. They just adjusted the numbers and that was it. They were very careless. They left their work papers out when they went for lunch. They sometimes left it into their, into their work paper box and they left it unlocked. Sometimes they'd lock their work paper box but left the work papers out. But worse than that, it's, and it's not a joke, but it might seem funny, is you know, you have a paper, I don't, I don't have one. You have a box of paper clips, maybe this small, right? You know what they did? The audit work papers were locked in the trunk. The key was left in the box of paper clips on one of the desks that we provided them with. And that night, all we did was go into the box of the paper clips, open up the trunk, see what they were doing, and do whatever we had to do. To change inventories, to change accounts payable, look into what areas they were doing, look into any of their concerns on the audit, and that's how we were able to accomplish a $45 million, maybe $50 million inventory for 1986, 1987. The family started quarreling with each other. There was a there was a, Eddie had not uh, had a very good marriage with his first wife. And this family, uh, the, the family kind of took sides. One side of the family was for Eddie and the other side of the family was for his wife. And what happened was is that his, his wife, his ex-wife challenged the divorce. And after that kind of, while everybody's in the midst of committing this fraud, all of these conspirators are having a civil war with one another. We lost control, another management group taking advantage, thinking that Crazy Eddie was a big jewel, and its only problem was family turmoil, uh, not knowing that there was, a, 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 early on, not knowing there was a fraud going on, but again, being assisted by various members of the Antar family that were now aligned against Eddie. 
took over the company in November of 1987. Uh, about nine days after they took, the first thing they did, the first day, they took over the company at three o'clock. I got my uh, pink slip at six o'clock. I was out on my backside. That was after 16 years. My whole life was, 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 I was devastated. My whole entire life was working for that one company from the age of, uh, from the age of 14 to the age of 30. That was my entire life. I was 30 years old at the time. They took an inventory nine days later. They came up with their financials. They found about a 40 to 50 million dollar gap between what their balance sheet was and what it should be. And then the investigation really took steam. Knowing his fraud had been discovered, Eddie Antar fled the country. He eluded authorities for nearly two years under a variety of assumed identities, living off the funds he had stashed in international accounts. Eddie moved from country to country with fake passports, always one step ahead of the authorities. But in Switzerland, 28 months after his company crashed, he made the mistake which ended the chase. When bank officials in Bern refused to let him at the 32 million he had in an account there, Antar angrily sought help from the local police. What Antar didn't know was that the U.S. Justice Department had frozen his account. Upon learning from bank officials that the irate man in the police station demanding access to his funds was actually a fugitive, the police promptly arrested Eddie Antar. He was then returned to the U.S. and sentenced to 82 months in prison. I never spent the day in jail, okay? And you know, I'm, I've been lucky not to have spent the day in jail. And you know something, I should have spent the day in jail. Not even a day, I should have spent years in jail for what I did. Chief financial officers that have done much less than me have spent much longer time in jail, spent tens of years in jail, 10 years in jail. I was lucky.